All right, so um, <coughs> we uh, started teaching inheritance by uh, <coughs> using the animal class. <coughs> <coughs> so what we first created, the first thing that we created was just an animal class. And we said an animal can do certain things. We wrote, we did dynamic memory allocation, all those good stuff to have a quick review of how dynamic memory allocation works. We said an animal has a name. And then we went through uh, setting the name and doing all the good things that it can do. And at the end, we added three methods that identified an animal as an animal, how an animal acts, how it moves, and how it makes a sound. Then. We said that if we, whenever we ha we need to, um, uh, when we are writing code, let me close all these, to better a class, to better a class, we do inheritance. But putting it in programming terminology, inheritance is nothing but, should I close it? No. OK. Inheritance is nothing but reusing your code. How did we reuse our code when we were doing structured programming? It was pretty simple. We wrote functions, and we recalled functions over and over. We kept invoking functions we have written, and we said we are reusing our code. But that became a little too chaotic because the programs got more complicated. And therefore, because they got complicated, we tried to come up with a terminology, some kind of a methodology that fits our real world. So we said, let's actually set our programming language to work like what real world is working, how real work is, is working. And by, when looking at real world, I see instances of the same thing keep happening and repeating in different ways. They share some uh, common features, and they are different in their own distinctions. Okay, And we call that inheritance. So we said we have an animal. Now out of an animal, I can create a cat. I do not need to reinvent the wheel and go through everything. All I need to do is to actually <coughs> add the features that I want to add for a cat. I want. I want the cat to act to move, move, but making a sound, I didn't care, so I did not improve that one. And I said, whenever I inherit something from a class from an old class, all the features of the old class are inherited without exception. The access to the features, however, are a little different. A child cannot access the private property of the parent. But of course, indirectly, it can access it because all the public properties of the of the parent are accessible, so the child can use those. So all the features a, a parent, a base class, is carrying, an inherited, a derived class, will carry and will work with it. We talked about different levels of inheritance, and we said um, if something is private, it is for the class, and if any class inherits anything from that class, it remains private, and even the derived classes cannot access it. And we talked about that if you have a child, your child doesn't use your toothbrush. It's your private thing, right? But when we said sometimes you have properties that your child can use, it can, he can borrow your uh, um, car and go out with it and stuff like that. So there are certain properties of you that is protected for your family and your children and your descendants, not for everyone else. That's the exact same thing we have in inheritance over here, which means classes that we have, we can have a keyword protected. And if we have protected, that is not shown over here. If we have protected, then the protected parts of uh, uh, a class can be uh, accessed by the child. So if my animal had something protected, that is move, it can actually be accessed by the child directly, but not for, for the rest of the children, but not to, uh, for anyone outside. So an animal, in this case, uh, can, be, uh, can move, but nobody can move an animal. An animal can decide by itself if it wants to move or not, OK? But if you, if you inherit a pet from an animal, then the movement changes. Therefore, 
a pet can use the animal's movement and directly call it, but uh, it cannot, uh, no one else can. So that's kind of a thing that we were talking about. So anything that is protected, only the derived class can access it. We mentioned how you access parents. We mentioned how you access uh, the parents actions directly. How do we do that? By simply using the name of the base with a scope resolution. Remember, when you inherit from a class, that class, class is not a different object. Therefore, the dot that you use to, for something that belongs to an object doesn't apply in here. If I have animal object, I call it A, and I want to call the move of the animal, I'll go A dot move. Well, when I create a cat out of an animal, a cat is an animal, therefore all the properties of, a, of an animal is accessible by cat. But if cat wants to invoke the animal part of itself, the way to do it is animal, scope resolution, and then the rest of the story. Okay? So whatever you want, whenever you want to directly access any action of the parent, you put the name of the base class, the parent, and then scope resolution and what you want to be done. Therefore, when cat moves, first it invokes how an animal moves and then adds its own features to that movement. Next. After that, we talked about how we talked about how <coughs> derived classes can be referred to or, or, or invoked by their base classes reference or pointer. We always said cat is an animal, and we said the keyword is essentially dictates inheritance is in play over here. So you, your, you are saying when you say cat is an animal, it means cat is inheriting from an animal. Therefore, if I have a pointer of animal, there is nothing to stop me to, act, to, to refer to a cat with that pointer. The problem that came out over here was that we had this uh, rule of invocation in hierarchy of classes where when you have a reference of something, always the methods closest to those reference will be called. So if I have an animal pointer pointing to a cat, the movement, the action, the sound of an animal will be called rather than the cat. Therefore, all the improvements you have made to the animal to create a cat will be hidden from you because you are referring to a cat as an animal. Yes, sir. Uh, can we use typecasting to change it from animal to cat? Yes, but that typecasting is essentially, again, when you have a cat and you cast that cat to an animal, either you put it in a pointer of an animal or you put it to a reference of an animal, right? Doing such a thing is essentially what I mentioned. Referring to a base class, to a derived class using the base exact same thing is going to happen. What you see right now over here, when I say in line nine, animal pointer PTR2, so I have two pointers of type animal, and I'm holding an animal and a cat in there. For the compiler to be able to hold the cat pointer in an animal pointer, for it, for it is to cast. So the casting is happening, you are not seeing it. Okay, so what he says, can I do direct casting instead of it? Yeah, so what compiler is doing for you right now is essentially this. Compiler says, animal, pointer, this. So it essentially casts that because new cat returns a cat pointer, right? So behind the scene, compiler is doing that. 
So essentially, it's doing what you are saying. But we don't need to write it because we know casting happens automatically in C++. Always C++ tries to make things work. So whenever you have some kind of an assignment, reference passing, or anything like that, and the two types are not the same, compiler always tries to figure out to cast the one that is being passed uh, through assignment or reference to another type of object to, to temporarily change the type. Yes? Would students still do that even if the method is virtual? Oh, let, we'll talk to, about virtual. Okay. We'll come to virtual. Okay. So at this point, we don't know what virtuals are. So we just know that because the uh, newest version, uh, sorry, because the closest uh, method, closest function to a reference is called, if I refer to a cat using an animal reference, the features of cat will be hidden. We won't be able to see it because it's used that way. Now, and that's a problem. That kind of nullifies all the effort that we made to actually improve a class. To improve a class is to be able to make sure that all my improvements are in effect. If I cannot improve the effects, the, the actions, and the features of a class into a new class permanently and with guarantee, then they, I'm in trouble. The whole idea of inheritance is to be able to make so many different versions of the same class and use it. I want to be able to have a vehicle class. And out of that vehicle, I have motorcycle, bicycle, airplane, car, train. And then what I need to do, I tell to vehicle now carry passengers. And I don't care how do they do that. Bicycle carries its passenger as a bicycle. Airplane carries its passenger as an airplane. I don't need to worry about how the vehicle is carrying the passengers. All I need to do is an array of vehicles, put all my vehicles in it, and I say, shoo, go do your thing. And each one knows how to do it. If the closest method of a class is to be called, then a vehicle won't be able to do anything because it doesn't know. You cannot go to another continent with a bicycle. It's not going to work out. So it's not going to work. And the solution, the remedy for that is virtuality, which essentially means, which essentially means If I want to make sure a method of my class is always updated, I have to make sure that method is tagged as virtual. So any method that I tag as virtual, any method that I tag as virtual is in force to invoke the latest version of that method. So in an animal, in this case, if any derived class out of animal re-implements act and sound with the exact same signature, it's guaranteed that no matter what type of a reference is pointing to that animal, the latest version is called. If it's a cat, the cat is going to move. If it's a bird, a bird is going to fly. If it's a, a worm, a worm is going to crawl. So it's the movement of every single animal automatically is improved to the one that is. And if I want to, so I was talking about acting and I said move. Sorry about that. So acting, the, so the, but the move over here is problem now because it's not virtual. If somebody inherits something from the animal, the movement is not going to actually get improved because I didn't make it virtual. So when you are creating a class, you have to look at the methods that you are making and go think about the logic. Do I ever think that if somebody wants to inherit out of, my, out of this class, does this thing need to be improved or it has to remain intact the way it is? If you want the action of a class to always remain the same and never change, don't make it a virtual. 
if you want the actions you implement to improve in further inheritances, then you have to make it virtual. And there is only one action in a class that is mandatory to always be virtual. One action, no matter what, you have to always make it a virtual, and that action is? A destructor, thank you. A destructor in a class must always, always be virtual. I told you, anytime you create a destructor, make it virtual. Even if you're 100% sure your class is never going to get inherited. Why? Because if it gets inherited, a non-virtual destructor leads to memory leak. Because if somebody refers and creates a pointer and dynamically allocates a base class out of your class and that pointer is deleted, because your destructor is not virtual, only the parent part, the base part, will be deallocated and the rest will remain the same in the memory. So you should always make sure the only action you need to make virtual is a destructor. Always. 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 So you will not see me asking you in your projects to make the destructor virtual. It's given. It's a default. It's a fact that you have to do it. And if I told you to do it, if I told you that the destructor should be virtual, I made a mistake I shouldn't have. Okay? You have to make sure that uh, your destructor is virtual. Now, down to this point, do we have any problem? This was a review of what we've done last time. Okay? Any problems down to here? I'm getting errors in here for some reason. Um, All right. So, now we're going to move to a new thing. Okay? So, we know what virtual methods are, and we know how they act, and we know that by definition, if you are going to an interview, somebody tells you, what, what, does, a virtual, what does virtual do? Immediately, you have to say virtuality guarantees that the latest version of an action is always called. That's the perfect, to the point, textbook answer to what a virtual is. And it's not only a textbook answer, it is something that you have to really understand and feel. And don't look at your friend's notebook when you are actually listening to a lecture. Okay? So, uh, are we okay down to here? All right? Let's talk about the class human. Do we agree that talking is a virtual method of a human being? Literally, all human beings talk, even if they are not educated in some tribes in some place that, are ne that they've never seen civilization. They have some form of language of their own, so they can talk. Correct? So all human beings can talk. Human being can talk. Can I create an instance of a human being? Can you show me and tell me that's human? Can you, if I told you, bring me a human being, can you do that? Do you have enough information to do so? If you are Michelangelo and you can sculpt like crazy, okay? And I'll tell you, create a sculpture of a human being. Can you do that? Can you? Anyone? It's not a trick question. It is, maybe it is. I don't know. Can anybody tell me? Can, can it be done? Can we do that? No, because we don't know what's the gender. Right? If I told you, show me a human being, you do that. Okay? You can do it in two seconds. But if I told you to actually create a sculpture of a human being, you freeze. You have no idea what to do. Is human being something that you don't understand? Is anybody over here 
has any doubt what a human being is. Like, if I told you human being, will you think this is a human being? No. Human being has specific definition and is completely clear to you what it is. But yet, you can't do anything about it. You cannot, you cannot put your hand on it. You cannot materialize a human being until it's inherited to a more definite thing. A human being should get inherited to female and male. And then from there, I don't know, to ethnicity of the human being when you want to create them. Oriental people have certain features. People from Africa have certain features. I'm not being stereotyped. I'm just stating the facts. If you want to sculpt or if you want to paint somebody from Africa, it's going to be completely different with a person who's from, I don't know, Mongolia. Different types of features, right? This is what it is. We call these type of base, we call this type of base classes who are an absolute definition of what is to come next, abstract base classes. Classes that define what is to come. You are guaranteeing a human being can talk, but you cannot implement that action because you don't know if the person is going to speak Arabic, Chinese, English, Persian. You don't know. The action of talking is there. You don't know how it's going to happen. So if I told you talk is a virtual function, it is indeed. The latest version has to get called. Not only that, you cannot even implement it. So what do you do? If you know a function must exist, but you don't know how to implement it, what do you do? You create a virtual function, but you make it pure. A pure virtual function is essentially a function that you are 100% sure that this class must be capable of doing, but you still don't know how. So you are telling anybody inheriting from my class must implement this action for it to be real. A human being is not a real thing, it's just an idea. A female human being is still an idea. A female human being and a male human being is still not implementing the talk method. They are adding some features to humanity, but they are not completing the feature. Then I'm going to say, I don't know, uh, a Japanese female, now I can actually implement the talk. Now it reaches to a point that the talk can be actually implemented. I have enough information to do so. Therefore, a Japanese female human being can be instantiated. The rest cannot. So classes who have pure virtual methods, methods that they must exist but we don't know how, are called abstract base classes and they can exist in different layers of inheritance. You can have a base class and a drive class, but still not, it added few things to, to the base class, but still not complete. So the only classes you can actually, only classes that you can actually instantiate, you can say something is A, like integer A. You can create an integer. If the only classes, or employee B, the only classes that you can actually instantiate and make something out of it are those who do not have a pure virtual method. All pure virtual methods are implemented. And how do we do that? How do we actually enforce that? This is how we do it. No, this is not how we do it. It's the next one. I opened the wrong thing. Uh, think about what I said for a second. Going to digest it and then we'll go through it. There you go. 
This is how we do it. Yeah. What's going on? Heal virtual animal. Hmm. Okay. I'll tell you how do we do it. So in here, I'm gonna I'm gonna make everything virtual. Let's say I don't know how an animal is to So let's say I don't know how an animal is to make a sound. I know an animal has a sound. What type of a sound? I don't know. If I don't know, I'm going to say virtual void whatever that I want it to be. And then I'm going to say set to zero. OK? By doing that, and of course, I'm going to go into the animal.cpp and remove the implementation of making a sound completely. So actually, the syntax is completely the, uh, relating to what I just said. You write the prototype of a wannabe function, and you put equal to 0. So you just tell to the compiler, this function must exist, but in future, not now. Therefore, the, 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 therefore, the class inheriting from an animal is to exist has to implement that function. Otherwise, you cannot. Now, the side effect of it would be, you see over here, I have this, the code that I have over here, if I run it, there is no change to this one. Oh, oh, oh it's, it's running the first one. Sorry, sorry, I have to change the target project. Let me change the target project. So if I run this, I get build errors. What does it say? Uh, virtual sound const yada reference action. Reference function public virtual void yada. Ah, oh, there you go. That's why. It's actually a beautiful error message. Let me just show you what it is. My cat was referring to animal sound. You see that? My cat is saying, hey, animal, make a sound. But we just made the animal sound method pure virtual. What does it mean? We want to have it, but we don't know how, so we can't call it anymore. You follow what happened? So I'll take that out. And hopefully that's the only error I have. So now if I run it, although, now if I run it, although the pointers of what I have over here are all of type like this, I have animals over here calling the thing, you see? Animal reference calling the action, animal pointer calling the action, but all that is there is cat. And another thing that I have over here that I need that you need to comp understand 100% is that because animal is an incomplete class, this cannot be done anymore. I don't know, uh, Fluffy, Tom, Jerry, OK? You can't do this. You cannot instantiate an animal anymore because Object of abstract class type animal is not allowed. Animal is now an abstract base class. So in final exam, when I'm asking you, what is an abstract base class, your answer is? A concept? Um, no, it's no, 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 no. Just, just give me the interview answer. How, what makes a class abstract? Yeah, a class that is incomplete. And a class is incomplete when that class has? <clears throat> what does an animal has to make it abstract? Pure virtual. So the answer to the question is that for a class to be abstract, 
it needs to have at least one pure virtual method. That makes it incomplete. That makes it unable to get instantiated. Remember that. Okay? Pure virtual methods, methods that are not... Okay, are we okay? Are we okay with this? All right. Now, so this cannot be done. Animal is abstract. So I'm going to say error. If I can type it, animal is abstract. Has at least one pure virtual method. How do you define a pure virtual method? You write the prototype that you wish to have. You wish the function to be called as such and such. You write the, 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 the prototype, you write in front of it equal to zero. So you write the prototype as if you want to write the function. If you want to have default values for the arguments, you put it. All the things you want the method to do, you do. And then you set it to zero. Okay? That means it's a pure virtual method. Are we okay with this? Now, in object-oriented methodology, in C++, we don't have any specific uh, thing for its implementation. Um, what is a string we have when I'm talking about in C language? Is there such thing as string in C language? We don't have anything called string in C language. String is essentially a, a kind of a deal that programmers made with each other. So when we create a character array, if I put a null at the end, let's call it a string. So there is no type string in C language, right? We just came up with such rule and we called it a string, correct? What I'm about to talk about right now is a concept of object orientation. We don't have any keyword for it, but we can implement it with C++. That concept is called an interface, okay? So in object orientation, when you say interface, you are talking about an abstract base class. Let's first clear that thing up. So when you say, what is interface? Interface is an abstract base class, which I'm going to mention why, what? When you are designing a class, sometimes the class that you are designing is only an idea. Everything about the class is just an idea. So you want a class, you want this object to have such features, but none of them are definite. So every single function that you want to write, you don't know how to write it. So all the functions inside that class are pure virtual. When you have such class, what you have is called an interface. So interface is a class that has nothing but pure virtual methods. And if you think about it, what we built down to this point was not an animal. What we actually created was a pet, when you think about it, right? All the things that I created over here was actually, they were all pets and I'll call them animals. So let's correct what we were creating. I need to have an animal, but my animal is an abstract, is a pure virtual thing. Why do not none of these things has IO stream for some reason? I don't know why. Anyway, so now take a look at this. <clears throat> I have an animal. Its act is pure virtual. It's move is pure virtual. The sound is pure virtual. Destructor, there is no pure virtual destructor. If you want to have a pure virtual destructor, create an empty destructor. Okay? Destructors cannot be pure. It's impossible. Okay? If you want to have a destructor, full, just have it with an empty body. Okay? Don't do anything in it. So 
the animal, the, the, the structure is virtual, I want to display it. Definitely I want to display an animal. I don't know how. That's pure virtual. I want to read an animal from console. I don't know how. But take a look at those two things. I actually overloaded the O stream for it. When you actually look at the animal CPP, you will see actually I am implementing the overload for C out. What the heck? I don't even know how it's supposed to be displayed. But I know how it's going to get overloaded. That's not part of my class. It's a helper function. It can exist. It doesn't do anything to my class. My class is still an interface. But I know how that interface is supposed to get printed. That doesn't make my class a non-interface, only an abstract. It is still an interface. But the good thing is that none of the children of animal need to ever get overloaded by C in and C out. They are all automatically overloaded. Why? Because the parent is. They all know. And because the display is a pure virtual method, always the latest version of display will be called automatically. I don't need to worry about it. I show a cat, a cat will be shown. Although it's an animal, but because the latest version is called, it is always a cat. Yes. Can you explain to me why you don't have like, a constructor in an interface that you have a constructor? Oh, I'll tell you why. That's a perfect, que perfect question, actually. Can I create, can I create, not an abstract based class, abstract based class still have functions and stuff, an interface. Can I create it at all? Do I, do I need to create it? That, that, so, no, can we create it at all? So we don't have a constructor of any kind. But when a class that is a child of an interface is created, should it be guaranteed that it's destroyed? No, no, that the children of interface. That's why I make the destructor virtual. That's why I have to. So the destructor is not actually doing anything. The existence of the structure over here only guarantees that the destructor of children are called. The constructor of children will be called because that's how you create them. You don't need to make them virtual. If you create a cat, you create a cat. You don't create an animal for it to be a cat later. It's impossible. So destructors, sorry, constructors are never needed to be virtual. That's why they cannot be virtuals. If you want to create a BMW, you create a BMW. You don't need to create a car and it becomes BMW later. Of course, you drive a BMW like a car. Like you drive a Honda, like you drive a Tesla. They are all driven the same way. So they are still children of car. But when you create them, you create the final product and put them all in the category of car so they all can be driven. Did I answer the question? Hopefully. Another question? I oh, hope I have another answer. So uh, let's say if we accidentally not include the virtual um, destructor. Uh, you will, it's a guarantee you're going to have memory leak. That's why I'm telling you, make it a habit. You create a destructor, make it virtual. It won't hurt. Just create an empty destructor. Empty destructor, make it, make it virtual. You don't have a destructor at all? Sure. Make a destructor, don't do anything in it. That's why every class that you create must have a destructor, and it must be virtual, even if you don't need it. That just guarantees no memory leak happens. That's something you need to have. Yes, sir. Virtual functions in a derived class, or you can only have them in a. Oh, yes, of course. Of course. It's like, let me tell you, like, mm, I want to see if I can come up with uh, something with humans that I can give you that answer. Uh, If you, create, if you inherit out of 
any class. Let's say you have a regular class that is not abstract nothing. You inherit something out of it. But some of the functions of that class are not still definite. You create a pure virtue. So as of that, so you can always, you can always create an abstract base class from a regular class. <laughs> that doesn't matter. You follow what I'm saying? That's a beautiful question. Virtuality can begin at any level of inheritance. It doesn't have to be the first one. You can have pure virtues. You cannot have an interface halfway through. That's mm, actually you can even that one. But an interface is always inherited from interfaces. You cannot do it the other way. So interfaces they are the only one that has to get it inherited from each other. So you can inherit an interface out of an interface. Like that, I'm going to say, uh, I think animal is not like, uh, like I don't know. I want to get something, make something else out of an animal. But still, that thing, everything is, I want, I want an animal to have more features that I don't know what they are. Something like that. Like an animal has uh, species in it. it has, so the animal that I created over here doesn't have species. So I create another animal. I'm going to say tracked animal or discovered animal. And I'm going to add a species in it uh, that does, so this species act like a certain way. And the species method then becomes virtual again. OK? Good questions I'm getting. Thank you. Any questions down to here? Now, if I look at what I have over here, I have an animal. Out of an animal, I have a pet. And my pet has name and all the things that I put originally for an animal. But also, I have feral animals. Animals that are not pets. They don't have names. They may have a tag number. <laughs> you know, you find them, you put something in there, I don't know. Put it something around the leg or put it something on their ear, some tag that you to, to, to uh, study them. These are feral animals. They're animals, but they don't have names. They have some tags and things like that. So as you see, now the branch goes into two different ones. So if I actually look at the classes in this one, This is what it's going to look like. There you go. So now I have an animal. Out of an animal, I have a fear on the pet. Out of a pet, I have cat. And I can expand this thing and keep going. The good thing is that if I want to deal with only pets, I create an array of pets and I deal with it. But if I want to deal with all types of animals, I can create an animals and just go wild, do whatever I want to do. And it works perfectly. So, so if I look at the code that I have over here, you will see that. By the way, if you, wanna, if you want your Visual Studio to be able to do this, draw the schematics of your classes for you based on your programming, you have to have the enterprise. The community version won't do this. OK, just remember, download that one. I found it the hard way. I installed it. I came to the class, and I'm like, whoops, <laughs> it didn't work. So now I know. OK, so uh, uh, what I wanted to say is that if I actually look at the, the cat tester over here, now my cat is, uh, is an object of type animal. But over here, I can have a pet too. I can add a pet. But of course, I may have some features in pet that are not definite, then that makes it an abstract too. Or if any parts of, like, like Take a look at here. The pet that I have over here is implementing move and act and sound and everything. If this doesn't exist, which means a pure virtual method in pet is not implemented, then pet is abstract too. Although it added some improvements to animal, but it remains abstract. So for a class to be able to a real class, a class that can get instantiated, all pure virtual methods must be implemented. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Same time, like at now we are moving towards part of your study in in programming that the, you don't have ginormous amount of code anymore. It's concept that is difficult. 
you will see. Like the next things that are coming in, the milestones that are coming in, you're going to have three or four milestones total. I'll try to finish it, the whole project to be done before, a week before final exam. So you may, you may have a class that just has three function calls in it. But you have to really sit and think and see how the function calls has to be done. Which ones have to be pure. Like, if I ask you to create an interface, what are you going to do? It's just a class with few prototypes equal to zero. So there is no coding involved. It's just design that's, that takes time. Okay? And that's essentially what programming is now. Any questions down to here? Suggestions? Objections? Let's have a break. I want to see what I'm going to teach next. I, let's have a break, OK? Please, when I say let's have a break, I'm trying to get, make things ready. And for some reason, let's have a break. People are hearing, are you do you have any questions? <laughs> so first, anybody has any question? Yes. So if we make the class virtual, and we set it equal to, not, not equal to zero, but we just make, make it, it virtual. Basically and then we put an empty brace at the end, we'd have to implement that over and over again. Is that correct? No, you don't have to. Virtual methods can just stay. It means would, that you... Would it go to each function that is... Yeah, if it's done later, if, it, if the if a same class with the exact same signature is created later, it's going to go through it automatically. automatically. But if you, don't, if you don't implement it, then it's fine. Please remind me to continue recording.